Welcome, uh, Anna here, and we're going to talk about part seven where we look at um, the relationship between the length of a muscle fiber and how much tension it can exert, muscle tone, recruitment, a couple of kind of related topics. All right, so let's go ahead and start talking about this. So when we're looking at the relationship between length and tension, um, basically what you're looking at is how long is the muscle fiber or the muscle cell so and basically what you've got is stretch all right the more stretch there is the more potential shortening you can have so it's kind of like the relationship between how stretched it is versus how shortened it can become okay so it's this like relationship that you're starting with if it's too short before stimulated, you get a weak contraction, okay? If it's too stretched out before it's stimulated, you um, don't get enough cross bridge formations. So it's kind of like a Goldilocks, Goldilocks situation where you need to have the right relationship between the two of them, okay? So you're looking at finding the optimum resting length before you begin the contraction, which is all going to eventually lead you back to the concept of muscle tone, okay? So your nervous system, basically the autonomic, excuse me, not the autonomic, ah, where's my eraser? Um, you're just your nervous system, okay? So it's basically gonna be sending, so it's autonomic if it's cardiac or smooth muscle, but if you're dealing with skeletal muscle, it's voluntary. Um, so anyway, the nervous system is going to be sending constant signals that maintain a certain ratio of cross bridge attachments at all times in order to maintain that, um, that muscle tone, okay? Let's look at some pictures. Okay, so what I like about this particular picture is the way they're showing a, um, a graph, all right, versus the overlap you would see in the actual picture. So you've got this section and you've got that section, okay? And we're basically gonna be comparing the two of them, okay? Um, so if you start right here, notice the graph, sarcomere length in micrometers, okay? And then you've got the resting tension after you do stimulation, okay? So how much force, how much force is gonna be generated, okay? So let's look right here first, okay? This is the region of optimum resting length. So up here, if we look at this picture, um, where's my highlighter at this button? What you're gonna see is you've got your thick filament here, and you've got your thin filament here and here, and you've got your cute little Z disc. So you can see right here, there is a certain amount of overlap between the thick filament and the thin filament. And they're not really showing it, but basically you'll have a certain percentage of those things that are always attached, because if they aren't, you will get a situation more like this, okay? If you do not have constant overlap. So over here in this picture, what you see is right here, you only have this tiny little section where the two are overlapping so that, um, so that you can only have a few cross bridge attachments. So more cross bridge, okay? Too little, I'm gonna just abbreviate cross bridge. So this is, the just right area, okay? Now let's look over here at this one. So overly contracted, and what you see is that at rest, the thin filaments are already overlapping in the middle. That means this only has a very short distance it can contract. So Basically, before the signal runs out, it's gonna meet maximum contraction, which means it has less ability to shorten and move things. Over here, it has too little ability to shorten things, 
because it's not going to reach the middle before the signal runs out, okay? And this one's too much cross bridge, okay? Over here, it's just right because you're going to have the optimal distance to overlap in order to fully use the nervous signal to its maximum. Now, if we look at this graph right here, they're showing this is the sarcomere length. So this is corresponding to this part right here. How long is this? So between here is the optimal length. Now here is force, okay? So what it's showing you is that when you're at this optimal length, you get the most amount of force. When you have too many cross bridge attachments and it's too short, you can see that over time, you do not get nearly as much strength, okay, as you would right here. Whereas when it's overly stretched, you can see that it takes a longer time to get it to move, and it's never gonna hit this peak the way the optimal overlap did, okay? All right, here's a picture showing a similar thing, all right? So right here, you have optimal overlap, Okay, so it's showing you the amount of overlap here. You've got good amount of space for contraction. Here, you've got too much overlap in the middle. Here, you don't have enough overlap. So this you could think of as the muscle bound version. So you got big fat muscles, they look really good, but they can't move as much as the optimal one can. Over here, we've got the flabby muscle. It's too stretched out so that by the time the nervous signal runs out, it has not reached the center, and so you do not get as efficient of a contraction. Okay, so again, muscle length is related to how much tension or force can be generated. All right, let's look at the next slide. All right, so we can build on these concepts a little bit more. We can look at, um, Hold on a second. Right, okay. We can look at the involvement of the motor unit. So we've talked about the motor unit before. Um, so motor unit is when you've got one neuron and how many muscle cells, how many muscle fibers can it recruit, okay? So one motor unit is gonna just do a small number of fibers. Two motor units is gonna do, um, excuse me, they're actually kind of showing this a little bit different. A different set of, of um, fibers and then the large is going to go with motor unit three so this would be like one muscle belly okay and you've got three different neurons coming to it and you've got one motor unit that's going to get some smaller fibers that are fairly quick but they're not super super strong and it gets those going but you need to pick up something bigger so now you're gonna recruit the second motor unit and you're gonna have some bigger muscle cells getting involved and they're gonna have more movement. So you can see right here, this is tension or force and this is how long it takes to go. And then if you need to pick up that bowling ball, you engage the third motor unit and you get bigger muscle cells and you get bigger movement. Now, notice this time component right here. So this is faster to get going so you can initiate the movement. It takes a little bit longer to get all this moving and a little bit longer to get all that moving. So kind of think of it as like a train, all right? When a train starts, it doesn't start at 60 miles per hour. It's gonna be starting at a slight chug, all right? And then it's gonna get up to being a little bit faster, and then it's gonna be going 60 miles per hour, okay? All right, let's look at the next slide. All right, so now we're gonna bring in the idea of a muscle twitch versus tetany. Okay, so right here we're looking at another graph and we have time and we have muscle tension or force down here, okay? So what you can see is we've got always muscle tension going. So this you could think of right here as the state of muscle tone because you always have some cross bridge attachments occurring, okay? So you're right here. Now we're gonna send a new signal to that neuron and we're gonna engage the motor neuron, or the motor unit, okay? Now we've got a short latent period because you have to get the action potentials down the T-tubules, get all that calcium, 
released and get the sliding filament mechanism going, okay? So that's the latent period. Then what you see is the contraction phase where you begin to start moving the sliding filament mechanism, all right? And then it peaks and you're beginning to go back into the relaxation phase and it goes back down. When you have a single contraction, we call this a muscle twitch. It's not a sustained contraction. It's like blip down, blip down. Okay, next slide. All right, this is one of my favorite slides uh, because of the way it shows you the time right here, the force right here, but then it's got three different muscles. It's got an eye muscle, and then it's got the superficial calf muscle and the deep calf muscle. So gastrocnemius versus soleus. And they're all showing twitches, all right? And so we got time here, milliseconds, and then force right here. And what you see is that the eye muscles are very small muscle cells and they engage very rapidly with their muscle twitch. So within five milliseconds, it has peaked and gone back down to relaxation at 10. Gastrocnemius takes longer to engage. So the latent period is a little bit longer, the contraction is slower, it peaks later, and then it comes back down, okay? Now what I love is the way they show soleus. So you see soleus is right here, and it takes even longer to peak, and then uh, longer to have its refractory period um, end. So each one of these is a single contraction, it is a muscle twitch. I like this because it demonstrates how when you're doing plantar flexion, when you start, gastrocnemius is the agonist, but if you hold it for more than 20 seconds, or 20 milliseconds, soleus takes over as the agonist, okay? I think that's just really cool on this picture. Now, over here, what they're showing is the amount of time different muscle cells can take to engage, so very a uh, motor unit that goes to very small muscle cells or very fast, motor unit that goes to intermediate or middle size muscle cells is slower, um, but still fairly quickly, and then going to big fat muscles takes longer. All right, next slide. All right, now I want to talk about graded muscle responses, okay? So when we're talking about graded, we're talking about the degree of contraction, okay? And there's a lot of variation in how that happens. Now we have two ways to discuss this. Two ways to discuss the graded response, or two ways of grading it, all right? You've got one, you can talk about the speed, which also is sometimes discussed in terms of frequency, all right, so how fast it is. And this is gonna be things when we use words like muscle, twitch, summation, all right? Tetany, both incomplete and complete, but we don't typically do complete in normal, anything outside the lab. I don't like the way that looks messy. Tetany, okay? You can also talk about it in terms of the strength of the contraction. So we've got speed and frequency versus strength, okay? And there are different things that are gonna affect strength. So first of all, you've got recruitment. How many motor units and how many muscle cells are being asked to do the are being asked to move, okay? You can also turn could talk about it in terms of the initial stimulus strength, okay? So the, the neuron that is stimulating the muscle cells, does it release a lot of acetylcholine or just a little bit of acetylcholine, okay? So a stronger signal keeps the action potential being triggered more frequently, okay? Um, you can also look at threshold stimulus, okay? So what is the minimum electrical signal that you need to start the muscle contraction, all right? And you can also talk about maximal stimulus, okay? What is the strongest, strongest signal 
to get all motor units engaged all at once. Okay, so these basic things. Now, so a lot of this is going to be right now, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Vocabulary, so muscle twitch. twitch. For summation, you have wave summation and you have temporal summation. Get used to those terms because we're going to do them again in the nervous system. And then tetany, you can talk about incomplete and complete. But keep in mind that that is only in the lab situation. In life, you do incomplete tetany. Okay? All right. Um, let's look at the next slide. All right, this particular slide is showing you three graphs. You've got one, two, and three, okay? And what they're showing on this graph is the strength of the signal versus how much muscle tension is being generated, so how much force is being generated. And you can see I've got a contraction and an electrical signal. Electrical signal contraction, electrical signal contraction. What you see is in this region, everything goes back to a resting state right in here. All right, so it's relaxing between contractions. So if you've ever seen like a tick in your eye or somewhere else in your body where you're just getting this like rhythmic contraction, um, but it's going back and relaxing afterwards, that would be an example of a muscle twitch, okay? So it ticks in your body, all right? This is more normal contractions that you see, okay? What you see is that the each signal, there's not enough time between them for you to go back to resting muscle, muscle length, okay? So each time it contracts, it gets a little stronger, so a little bit more force, and a little closer together, okay? This would be considered temporal summation where you're adding together the signals and then also incomplete tetany. And this is a normal muscle contraction. Over here, what you see is the beginning of a signal, but then it flat lines way up here. And basically what you've done is in the lab, created a muscle spasm that will not end. Okay, and this is considered complete or fused tetany. All right, next slide. All right, here's my little slide where I talk about recruitment. And um, it's one of my favorite pictures to look at this, okay? Um, and what you have is three different ways of showing recruitment, okay? So right here, we're looking at the stimulus from the neuron and how much voltage is released. So right here is threshold, okay? And you can see I've got a, a nervous signal, low, it didn't reach threshold, low, didn't reach threshold, low, almost at threshold, but not quite. Oh my gosh, I hit threshold. Now I can generate a contraction. And then this would be the maximal signal. You know, basically you've got full engagement. You can't do any more. Then right here, it's showing the actual recruitment of the muscle cells. So this is a muscle belly, and each one of these things is a muscle cell. And you can see down here, these signals are sub-threshold. You are not generating an action potential right here. And you can see all of these are still a pale pink. Now here, we're, we're hitting threshold, but we're not very strong. So we're only engaging two muscle cells, okay? But here, we've gotten a little stronger, and I've engaged one, two, three, four, five muscle cells. This one, more. This one, more. Here, we've reached maximal stimulus. So it doesn't matter how strong this neuron signal gets, at this point, because I have engaged every single muscle cell, every single motor unit is engaged, okay? Now, right here in this one, we've got the tension. This is actually measuring how much force is being generated over time. And you can see right here, there's nothing. Here, I've got two cells engaged, I get a little bit of force. Here, I've got more cells, I get more force. More cells, more force. More cells, more force. Here, it's maximum because I've engaged every motor unit, I can't possibly make the signal any stronger than it actually is, okay? All right, let's look at the next slide. All right, so the Saladin book took out the concept of TREP, but I find that people are interested in this idea, so I'm gonna throw it back in. Um, and basically, this idea 
is, um, hold on a second, I'm losing my spot, is that, um, so you, you want to know why do you need to warm up your cells before you start exercising, okay? So this graph is kind of showing you what's happening. So I've got the signal, the stimulus signal, and I've got how much tension is being created in the muscle cell. So when you first start doing contraction, your muscle contraction isn't as strong, but over time, as you do more contractions, it gets stronger with the same amount of stimulus. So each one of these stimuli, each one of these electrical signals is the same. The first three are a little bit weaker, and then it's kind of, it's basically warmed up, okay? The idea here is that cold muscle cells are not going to contract as strongly as warm muscle cells when given the same stimulus. There is a couple of different hypotheses out there as to why, but this is my favorite one. And it has to do with the fact that you're storing that calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and it takes a little bit of time for it to flood into the cytoplasm. And between muscle contractions, you're putting the calcium back, but it takes a little bit of time. So from here, I didn't get all the calcium put away. All right, so that by the time I get to here, I've got kind of like this residual calcium left in the cytoplasm between each contraction so that I can have more cross bridge attachments occurring with the same amount of stimulus here compared to here, okay? All right, let's flip over to our last slide. All right, so let's talk about the strength of our muscle contractions. So how much, so the cross bridge is the critical component here, okay? So how many myosin heads are attached? Okay, the more myosin heads you have attached, the more actual force you're gonna get, okay? So this determines the force or strength of the contraction, okay? So what are our factors that determine this? We've got four major factors that you're gonna be dealing with that de help determine the overall contraction strength, okay? So this is the, like, the ultimate down at the myofilament level, okay? So now we're gonna look at some of the other things that help determine how many myosin heads can attach and how many muscle cells, okay? So first of all, you've got the number of muscle cells or muscle fibers that are recruited, okay? The more you have recruited, the more you have contracting, the greater the force will be, okay? Second one is gonna be the size of the muscle cell itself because uh, thicker cells thicker cells have more myofibrils all right so the thicker the cell is the more the thicker the diameter the more myofibrils you have the more potential cross bridge attachments you can get okay and then you've got the frequency of the stimulus, okay? So how, um, how fast are the nerve signals that are coming to that muscle cell, okay? Do you have any kind of summation going on, whether it's wave summation or temporal? summation, okay? And then finally, we're gonna look at that muscle length relationship again with the degree of muscle stretch, okay? So remember, you want optimal length to get the optimal amount of force, okay? So that length tension relationship is important, okay? All right, that is the end of this part of the muscle physiology um, lecture slide. So I'm gonna stop the recording now.